Hey, if you will, go and grab your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter five. We're gonna do the whole chapter this morning, Revelation chapter five, as we're continuing our series and our study through the book of uh, Revelation. So we'll be there together. Um, hey, Jalen, Colton, and Noah, can you guys help me? Pass these out. Hey, if you did not get a Revelation card, would you raise your hand up? And these three strapping young lads, uh, one of them will bring, will bring one to you. Hey, Colton, you can do the middle. Colton, you can do the middle. You love attention. No? If you raise your hand, we'll get you a card. They're in the lobby as well, so if you need some, they're out on the tables uh, if you need anything like that. If you need a chair, um, Jeff's using his arms to carry the chairs in. With Jeff's arms, he carried like 40 chairs just now. Jeff Underwood, just all 40 chairs with one bicep, carried them in. It was amazing. If you could see what I see, it'd be amazing. Uh, go and grab those cards. You're gonna use them. It gives, on one side gives you the series schedule. On the back side will give you just some hints and clues for us as we study this book together. This has been a mystery to many of us uh, for a long time. It will be in Revelation uh, chapter five this morning. So if you found it, why don't you go ahead and stand up and we're gonna read God's word. Oh, this will be tricky, boys. Raise your hand real high. Pretend you're not Baptist just for a second and raise your hand on up there. Pretend you're Pentecostal and we'll find you. We'll find you. All right, let's do Revelation chapter five. I'll read it, be on the screen. You'll see it in your text as well. Revelation chapter five, verse one. Then I, this is John, saw on the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom of and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And then I looked, and I heard around the throne the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, Blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we need your help again today, as we do. Uh, but we need your help now as we study your word. That through your spirit, you would teach us and lead us and guide us. God, open our eyes, our eyes and our hearts. Give us minds that would understand today. But I thank God, I'm just begging for you to give us hearts that would be soft enough to be molded through your spirit and by your word. Not by the words of any man, but by the word of God. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen. You may be seated. On the screen now will be some scripture I'm gonna use this morning. I'm just gonna have to reference a few of them just for the sake of time. Uh, and so we wanna take a picture of that, write it down, uh, particularly the Old Testament ones. We're gonna need to, um, gonna need to use that as we move forward uh, here this morning. So it's all up there for you to see. Uh, so I was thinking through this, uh, this passage. This chapter for me is one of the most epic, pivotal chapters in the book. It's one I think we have to get right. That if we don't get this right, we're not gonna understand the rest of it the way it's meant to be understood. And so it's very important for us to really understand Revelation 5. But like I said last week, it's tied to Revelation chapter four. And so we need to do some work to put all the pieces together here uh, this morning. But back in, uh, I think the 70s, uh, a Canadian philosopher, sociologist named Marshall McLuhan wrote a book, and it was about how the rise of media and what it was going to do to this generation, uh, not just because of what was being said, but because of how it was being said. So he made the argument uh, that when watching news coming through the TV, it would form us in a way that was intentional by them 
but would unintentionally form us in ways we didn't know. That what was being said wasn't even as important as how it was being communicated. And so the key line throughout his book is, the medium is the message. That's his point. That how is as important, if not more important, than the what. How we say something communicates in a deeper way uh, more than what we are actually saying. So I thought of a bunch of ideas of how to explain this. I love branding, so I kind of looked in that idea of branding and logo design, all that. But here's a place where I think we can all agree that the medium is the message, and I think it comes down to text messaging is where we understand it. How many of you would rather text than make a phone call? You'd rather text than make a phone call? How many of you would rather make a phone call than a text? You're liars, all of you. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right, so here's... Um, I'm just gonna show you, we've all experienced this before, so let me just, Laura, walk us through. Here's, here's the first, say you text somebody, hey, hey, when will you be here, right? That's a simple question, just wondering when you're here, I'm ready, when are you gonna pick me up, or when are you gonna be here for this Bible study? When are you gonna be here? Because I know that's what you guys, that's what you meant when you said that. You're coming over for Bible study, aren't you? So we can study together. And then you get the response is, I'm on my way. <laughs> How do you feel about that? You still want them to come over? You're like, listen, bro, all right, all right. Chill. It's the first time I asked. I was just curious if you were still coming. That's all I wanted to know. As opposed to you get this one, which is, oh, I'm on my way. Yeah, like, oh, cool. See you soon. So this, this is one you probably already had this morning. This next question, you would ask, hey, what do you want to do after, or for church, lunch after church? That's the question, right? That's the question. And then you get this response back, I don't care. <laughs> I don't care. You're like, then maybe we shouldn't do lunch. How about that? How about we don't do lunch anymore? How about we just stop being friends all together? As opposed to, maybe this is the answer, I don't care, I mean, whatever you want, that sounds fine. Or for all you millennials and alpha generations, like IDC, you know. You know, because texting words takes way too long, so I need to use letters instead. Gracious, we've, we've, we've gone really too far. Uh, here's one uh, that maybe you've gotten before, hey, I love you. Then you get this response back, I love you! She really loves me, right? She loves me. It's way better than this one. You say, I love you, and she's like, okay. <laughs> Friend zoned so fast when that happens. So again, it's the teenager way. Yes, oh yeah, that's the best. Hey, buddy, I love you. Okay, dad. Cool. All right, uh, here's, here's where we are. So what's important for us to remember is this this theme from Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message, okay? How we say something communicates something bigger and grander than what we're communicating. And sometimes, for a lot of us, uh, we've been misunderstood, not because of what we've said, but because of how we've said it. So you've got to remember a few things here about the book of Revelation as, as we move forward. And the first thing is that it's an apocalyptic prophetic letter. It's going to be important for us. Apocalyptic, not meaning end times, Brad Pitt, and zombies. Not that. Apocalyptic meaning, it reveals something. But it's a particular type of literature from the first and second century. In apocalyptic literature, uh, everything, there are symbols, uh, people represented by animals, numbers mean something, colors mean something. It's apocalyptic. So in apocalyptic literature, especially, the medium is the message. It communicates something. But it's not telling us something so we can build some kind of code, some kind of key to understand. It's not, it's not a decoder ring that you found in your, in your cereal box. It's not that. It's telling us something. It's supposed to be drawing us in. But the symbols, you're going to see it here this morning, the symbols we're given are not new symbols that we're meant to figure out with a newspaper next to us. They're symbols that have been symbols. They've been themes from Genesis through the other 65 books of the Bible. They're not new the issue for us as Western Christians is that we're not as familiar with all of that. And that's not to be ashamed of. We, just, we, weren't, we weren't raised that way. We're not wired that way. So we gotta understand that. Secondly, it's prophetic, not necessarily just future telling, but truth telling. It's in the long line of the prophets who would speak God's word to God's people. This is what it means. Thus says the Lord. And it's a letter that was written to churches being persecuted by the Roman Empire in the late first century. We gotta remember that. So it has to mean something to them. We don't get to interpret it based on our lens. So I'm gonna give you one more thing. It's that we said it before. It is written for us, but was not written to us. Now, it's for us to understand, but it was not written to us. So if I found an anniversary card that my dad wrote to my mom, 
I don't get to read that with myself in mind. I don't get to read about how my, how my dad loves my long brown hair and my short stature and my olive complexion. I don't, I don't get to do that because that's not about me. It's about my mom. Now, here's what's good for me. I get to learn how much my dad loves my mom. I get to learn a lot about marriage. I get to learn a lot about what anniversaries are. I learn from it, but it's not to me. Does that make sense? Revelation's the same way. We cannot make it about us. However, we can learn from it. We can read it as it is, interpret it through the lens of the first hearers, and then be able to then interpret it for us to understand what it actually means. Again, we said last week, four and five are connected. These two chapters are connected. So let me give you a recap of chapter four. John is taken by Jesus into a vision. He's taken in the spirit. He's in complete worship, taken in the spirit, where the curtain of heaven has been opened. So again, we do this thing where we make heaven this place that exists above our place. It's a next place. But the Bible doesn't speak of heaven that way. The Bible speaks of heaven almost as a different dimension that's in the here and now. And we need eyes to see it. And so what happens for John is that Jesus is, uh, gives him eyes to see it, then takes him on, on a tour of heaven. He pulls the curtain back, says, hey, come up here. Let me show you something. And the first thing he shows him is this throne that's there. And there's someone on the throne. Because the fear for John, he's exiled on, on the Isle of Patmos because he refused to declare Caesar as Lord back in Asia Minor. So he's writing this letter back to the seven churches under intense persecution to either give in or to give up to the Roman government. And Jesus gives John a glimpse of, hey, listen, I know it feels chaotic. I, feel, I know it feels like someone fell asleep at the wheel. It's not. Someone's on the throne. And the reminder is, it's not Caesar. It's not Domitian. It's never been Nero. But also, John, it's not you. It's not you. There's someone on the throne, and it's the Almighty. It's the, it's the King. It's God himself, God the Father. Then around the throne, it's almost concentric circles. we got four living creatures. And we said last week, because of numerology, we believe four represents all of creation, the whole of creation. And they're worshiping. Their eyes are fixed on the throne. Around them are 24 elders. And for all you math majors, 12 plus 12 is 24. 12 representing the Old Testament tribes of Israel. And the next 12 representing the 12 apostles in the New Testament. So it's a picture of the entire church from ages past to ages, present to ages future. And they're all gathered, fixated on the throne of the Almighty. And they're worshiping him there. The point again, the throne is occupied and God is in charge. I know it doesn't feel like it, but he's making order from the chaos you've experienced. He's okay, he's unrattled. And you should be too. That's where we pick up in chapter five, verse one. Then, John says, I saw. In reading Revelation, remember, highlight these places when John sees something. That's important for us. Remember, apocalypse means an unveiling, an uncovering. So it's important to know what he sees when he uncovers. He says, now, what I saw in the uncovering, in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. We've got to get our characters right. The him seated on the throne is God the Father, the Almighty, first person of the Trinity. He is on the throne, and he has a scroll written within and on the back. It's covered in writing. On the front and the back, it's everywhere there was open uh, parchment, there's writing on it. And it's sealed with seven seals. Now, just to be clear, not circus seals, letter seals. I don't need to misinterpret that. These aren't animals with balls on their noses. This is not what's happening here. I know some of you are like, oh, oh that makes so much more sense. Uh, seals would be like a wax seal where they would secure a letter or some an important document to be sent. Now, there's some debate about whether or not it's a scroll with seven seals on one side, or if it's one seal, you open that, there's another scroll with another seal all the way down to seven, like rushing nesting dolls. It's not that. That's one idea. It could be, it could be that we don't really know. I'm not sure it matters, but if you want to think about it, feel free to think about it. So here we go. So then the question is, well, what is the scroll? Isn't that the question? The question is, why is the scroll so important that it needs seven seals? Why is it so protected? What's, what's the point of the scroll? Well, this scroll, we've learned about a scroll even back in the Old Testament, particularly one like this, one that has been sealed. And so we see it in three places. It was on the screen earlier, but I'm gonna tell it to you again. Isaiah chapter eight, verse 16 
Ezekiel, the prophet Ezekiel, chapter two and three, has a similar vision. We talked about that. And Daniel, who has a similar vision in chapter seven, this happens in chapter 12. Now, this scroll that's been seen and the stories that's been passed down for generations is a scroll that has been sealed and then taken away. So now we get to Revelation 5, the end of the story, and the seal, the scroll pops back up again. Here's how Robert Mounts, a, a um, commentator, describes it. He says, the scroll contains the full account of what God, in his sovereign will, has determined as the destiny of the world. So the scroll, here's how we're going to interpret it. The scroll is the story of history, the story of the world from the beginning to the middle and ultimately to the end of it. It's the purposes and the plans of God. It contains the meaning of history and God's plan for bringing both justice to earth and heaven to earth. Remember back in Revelation 4, the peace we're supposed to feel is, oh, there's someone in charge. The Almighty hasn't given up. He's still in charge. And now we take it up a notch to say, oh, and he has a plan. It's not that he's just in charge trying to figure it out as it comes. So no, no, no. He's been working a plan together from the beginning of the age. He's got a plan. That's the hope for us. And the Almighty is holding it. So he has seven seals. Well, why seven? Well, look at your card. Seven represents divine completion, divine perfection, which means this entire plan is perfect. There's nothing missing from it, nothing you need to add to it. All you English teachers don't need to put red pen to it. It's fine. It's done. It's complete. It's completely divinely ready. Nothing is missing or out of order. So that's what John sees. And then verse two. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice. I, I wasted two hours of my life listening to a lecture about who the mighty angel is. And here's where I landed. IDC. <laughs> I don't care. I don't know that you should care we aren't given a name. I don't know who it is. We just know he's mighty and strong, has a loud voice. So maybe it's Danny. I don't know who it is. You're welcome. Uh, so I might answer him with a loud voice. All right, so don't get distracted by that. But here's what he's proclaiming. The question. In Revelation, pay attention to the questions. The questions matter. And then the answers matter. Here's the question. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? We gotta pay attention to the question. Now, the question is about worth, not ability. Do you see that? The question isn't about strength. The question isn't about ability or enough money. The question is about worth. The question is about security clearance. That's the question. Who has the credentials to open the scroll? That's what worth means. Who's worthy to do it? And then verse three. No one. No one. Who is worthy? I couldn't find anyone. No one in heaven, no angels, no saints that have gone before, no, no martyrs, no one could. No one on the earth, no other humans, no, not Mohammed, not Buddha, no one could open the scrolls. And then under the earth, no demons, no power of the underworld, no one, no one's able to do it or to look into it. No one can. So John is feeling what he's feeling on Asia Minor, suffering in persecution. He's had um, hundreds of his brothers and sisters brutally murdered by the Roman Empire simply for refusing to declare Caesar as Lord. He's been exiled to Patmos. He knows what's happening back on Asia Minor. He can't be there to help. He knows they're under temptation to give in or to give up. He understands what's happening. And so he has this vision and he understands, oh, someone's in charge. Oh, and there's a plan? And so now the hope is, can I know the plan? I want to know, how do I make sense of all that's happening? How do I make sense of the chaos in Asia Minor? How do I make sense of what I'm feeling? How do I make sense of that I'm here? I'm the beloved disciple, and I'm on the Isle of Patmos. How do I make sense of all of this? But no one can open it, which feels like a tease, doesn't it? Hey, it's in here, buddy. No one can open it, which is why we're taken to verse four. He begins to weep loudly. You know anybody who weeps loudly? Like no matter how they're weeping, it's loud. But this expression is the fact that it's uncontrollable sobbing. The kind where you're wiping snot from your nose with the back of your hand. It's like, <laughs> like that sound when you're trying to stop and you can't stop. That's what's happening. He's weeping, he's wailing loudly. Why? Because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Remember again, 
He finally has hope that someone's in charge and that there is a plan. And now he's being told, yeah, but you'll never know. And he weeps. He had hope that there was some purpose to all of this. He's like, please tell me there's a reason. Please tell me that all this is for a purpose. And he sees the scroll and he remembers Daniel and Ezekiel and Isaiah. And he's like, oh, there it is. It's the one that was sealed. We get to open it now. There's got to be someone to open it, but no one can, so he wept. And we would too, wouldn't we? And maybe you've been there, right? Like maybe you're walking or have walked in those seasons of why is all of this happening? None of this makes sense. Why the suffering here in my world? Why the suffering in the cosmic world? Why do three-year-olds have to go to the hospital? Why do good people die young and bad people live forever? Why did my spouse get cancer? Why did I lose my job? Why did she leave me? Why did he leave me? Why are my kids wilding out even though they know the good news of the gospel? Can someone give me a reason? And then you see it. You're like, oh, there it is then no one can open it. Now, what follows here, we've got to pay attention to. And not just with our eyes, with our hearts. This is the very heart of the Christian vision of ultimate reality. We've got to get this right. This is what's true. This is what's true. One of the elders said to me, stop crying. Stop weeping. So John's like, <laughs> he tries to stop, and then he can't, he tries to stop again. Stop, he says. Then the elder says to him, behold, look, lift up your eyes. It's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. He conquered, and he can open the scroll and the seven seals. The weeping of, who's going to tell me? Who's going to explain all of this? What's, what's the plan here? What's going to happen? Is this going to be forever? There's a, there's a scroll. There's a plan no one can open. And the elder says, stop it. One who can is here. Now watch how he's described. He is the lion of Judah. Here's what he hears. He hears lion of Judah. This takes us back to Genesis 49. So let me give you um, Cliff Notes version. You got Father Abraham. He had many sons. I am one of them. And so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Uh, those of you too young to understand, you're welcome. Uh, Abraham has a son named Isaac. Isaac has a son named Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons. These 12 sons of Jacob would be the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. This is how God's going to build his kingdom. For these 12 tribes. One of them, uh, one of them, well, there's 12, but one of them, he's not the oldest one, but his name is Judah. And in Genesis 49, uh, Jacob is giving a blessing to all 12 sons. And he gets to Judah and he says, you, Judah, you're like a lion. You're like a lion cub. And then the next verse he says, and you, essentially, you will carry the throne. You'll hold the scepter of, of reigning and ruling and it will never depart from your lineage. Now, what's interesting is, Judah's not the oldest. He shouldn't be next in the line. And yet, for some reason, he is in this blessing. And we would learn later that the Messiah, Jesus, comes from the line of Judah. So this phrase, the line of the tribe of Judah, had been used in the Old Testament to talk about the coming Messiah. He was described as a lion ruling with a scepter. This is who he was. So that phrase already triggers John to know, oh, he's here, the Messiah, the Messiah can do it. And then he describes him as the root of David, which takes us back to Isaiah chapter 11. There's a prophecy that even though it seems like the lineage would be cut off of Jesse, uh, there'd be a stump that would come up, or a, a root, a sprig that would come up, a, a new branch that would come out of the stump of Jesse. And from that sprig, from that new branch, from that new growth, from what was cut off, we would find the Messiah. He would come from that line. Jesse's son is David, King David, and we know that Jesus is from the Davidic line. So here's what's happening. The elder is saying, hey, John, he's here. You're okay. He's here. The lion is here. The, the root of David, he's here. And look at this. He's conquered. He's victorious. 
and that gives him the right to open the scroll and its seven seals. So pay attention to what he hears. What he hears is, hey, stop crying, John. There's a conquering lion who's here. There's a victorious lion that's here. We're gonna be okay. He's gonna open the seals. He's strong. You should see the muscles when he walks. You should see his long mane. You should hear his roar. The lion is here. And he came from nothing. And he conquered the final enemy. And you're gonna be okay. (coughs) And then watch this. Verse four. I'm okay. We're okay. It's really emotional. (coughs) Somebody give me a water. Coffee won't help. <laughs> Thanks, Kaysen. <clears throat> oh, was this yours? <laughs> Tastes like it. <clears throat> we're good, Cody, we're good. All right. Thank you. All right. Okay, here's Lion of Judah, strong and mighty. <clears throat> I need a mighty angel with a strong voice, Cody. Hey, thanks, buddy. Love you. <coughs> Joel, can you edit this out? You can edit, can you edit this out of the podcast? No. Fine. All right. Um, he hears, here's lion. <clears throat> mighty. Good gracious. Mighty lion. <coughs> You're not supposed to hear this part, I guess. Oh, this part's so good. It's so good. Okay. We're good. All right, here we go. Verse four. I weep loudly. One of the elders said, don't weep anymore. The lion is there. Then look at verse six. He hears lie in verse six. Before, between the throne, the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a what? A lamb. A what? Did you hear it? The promise is a lion, he hears lion, and he sees lamb. Can you imagine how disconcerting that would have been to him? Like, if it's me, I'm like, cool, cool, cool. Where's the lion, though? He hears lion of Judah, mighty, conquered, and he turns to see a lamb, but not just any lamb, a slain lamb, a lamb as though it had been, the phrase there is slaughtered slaughtered lamb. The lion conquered. The lion can open the scroll to, I saw a lamb. As though it had been slain. Listen, it gets worse than that, though. There's two Greek words in the New Testament that are translated lamb. One is for an adult lamb. That's when John the Baptist says, behold the lamb of God. That's an adult sheep. This one is for a baby lamb. He hears, we're gonna be all right, man. The lion that conquered is here. And John shifts his attention to find a little baby lamb. As though it had been slain. How do you know it had been slaughtered and slain? There's blood everywhere. I don't mean to be graphic, there's a slit in his throat. There's blood that had come down. There's scars on him. But he's standing, which is interesting, because if he was slaughtered, you'd think he'd be lying. But he's standing. Eugene Boring, in his um, commentary on Revelation, says, this is perhaps the most mind-wrenching rebirth of images in literature. The slot in this system reserved for the lion has been filled by the Lamb of God. From Genesis 49, we'd been looking for a lion. Because in Genesis 3, we were told, there's a hero coming who will crush the head of the enemy, the head of the serpent. Then we're told a few chapters later, it's a lion that's coming. And then the whole paradigm shifts in Revelation chapter five. Hold hold on. I thought we were looking for a lion. Yeah, yeah. And the lion's a lamb now. Like a baby lamb who had been slaughtered. So let me give you a spoiler. There's five main characters in the book of Revelation. You're gonna meet a dragon. You're gonna meet two beasts. We've met the one who sits on the throne, the Almighty, and then the Lamb. The Lamb is John's favorite way to talk about Jesus in the book of Revelation. He'll call him the Lamb 28 times between now and the end of the book. It's the primary way John refers to Jesus, which means for you and me, it has to be the primary way we see him. 
You understand that? Like, we have to see him now like this. But remember, this is symbolic. When we get to heaven, we're not going to see a talking lamb. That's not the point. The point is the medium. That's the message. What's being communicated is in, it's in the image. Now, picture yourself. You take the kids to the zoo, and your kids are like, ah, can we see the lions? Like, yeah, buddy, we can see the lions. Let's go. I love seeing lions. So you turn the corner, like here, like it's, it's a lion exhibit, and you see a sign. It's like, oh, lion from the Middle East. Cool, cool, cool. Let's see this lion. You can't wait to see the muscles on its shoulders and the long mane. You can't wait to hear him roar. And you turn the corner, and it's this little tiny lamb there. And your son's like, Dad, are you sure? You're like, I'm not, I'm pretty sure. And you look at the sign. It's like, lion from Judah? I don't know. Guess that's it. Like, aren't you disappointed? Don't you feel like that, that was a whole lot of buildup for nothing? Well, that's what John's feeling here. But then this bloody slaughtered lamb is described even more. It says he's given seven horns and with seven eyes, which is not the lamb that I pictured at all. Like when I picture um, sheep jumping over things to put me to sleep, I don't picture that because I'm not falling asleep to that. So the seven-horned, seven-eyed lamb. Now, take notes here. Horns, biblically, always denote power and government. That's what a horn represents. Coming out the idea of like a ram's horn. That, that's the idea. It denotes power. Seven, the number of completion. He's got divine power. This little baby slaughtered lamb, blood down its neck and chest, has divine power. And then seven eyes. And now we're given clues. The seven eyes of the seven spirits. We know the seven spirits are the picture of the Holy Spirit. We learned that back in, Gen- or in Revelation 1. But it's even more powerful than that. If horns mean power, eyes represent wisdom throughout the Bible. Seven eyes, perfect divine wisdom. So this little lamb, Mary's little lamb, slaughtered, but has divine power and divine wisdom. Hold on to that for later. Verse 7 so this lamb went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Did he use his hooves? Did he use his mouth? I don't know. Verse eight, and when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures, all of creation and the 24 elders, all of the church, remember these concentric circles we saw in Revelation 4, they fell down before the lamb. Now they're holding a harp and golden bowls of incense. So now you're like, was there a costume change? Was I distracted by the lamp? Then they went backstage and got some props. How did, how did all of this happen? Maybe. But again, imagery. So now, okay, so what's happening? Well, the harps, this is crazy. So the people of God throughout the Old Testament always being conquered by other nations. And at one point, Babylon comes in and conquers the people of God. They exile them out of Israel, out of Judah, take them to Babylon. And in Babylon, it gets real bad for them. It gets really bad. Prophets are saying things. They're just really, really struggling. And here's, here's Psalm 137. This is from that period in Babylon. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Zion speaking back to the promised land. We, we were in exile in Babylon. We just wept because we remembered it. Then watch this. And on the willows there, we hung up our harps. Some of your translations say lyres, which is a harp. Why? Because there our captors required us to sing songs, our tormentors that wanted joy of mirth from us. And they said, hey, sing us one of your songs. We like it when you sing. Sing us some of those worship songs you were doing. Sing that one we like. But then verse four, they cried out, but how, how, how can we sing the Lord's song? in a foreign land. So watch the picture. Isaiah 137, we're done singing. Exile, persecution, suffering, we can't do it. Revelation chapter five, you better get down those harps because we're about to sing. Do you see it? Why? Because worthy is the lamb. The lamb is here. And so the elders fall down. The elders have, have these harps, but they also have bowls of incense, which we are told here are the prayers of the saints. Well, what are the prayers of the saints? Well, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, the prayers of the saints are, how long, O oh Lord? How long are you gonna put up with this? How long will they beat us? How long will they kill us? How long are we gonna suffer persecution? How much longer? And so now it's as if we're about to hear the answer. 
And they've brought the, uh, the bowls of incense, the prayers. They're going to worship. They're going to get the answer to how long. Then verse 9, and they sang a new song. A new song? Well, yeah, because remember in chapter 4, they sang a song. Those were songs about the Almighty, God the Father. Here's a new one, because things have shifted with the appearance of the Lamb. Now the new song is, worthy are you, Lamb, to take the scroll and to open its seals. And so now the question is, what makes, what makes the Lamb worthy? Why wasn't the Lion worthy? Why isn't the Almighty worthy? Why isn't the, the Mighty Angel worthy? Why? For you were slain. How'd the lamb become worthy? By his death and the shedding of his blood. You're worthy because you were slain, you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What makes the lamb worthy is that he was slaughtered. It's his sacrifice that makes him worthy. His death makes him worthy. And then verse 11, but then John says, I looked and then I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. So that first circle. It's like, but then, so they begin singing this song. And then I hear the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. Now it gets even louder. And their song is, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Real quick count. How many words is he worthy of? Seven. He's worthy of all praise. Why? Because he was slain. How did he conquer? He was slain. But then watch this. You got the elders and the living creatures singing. Now you got the myriads of angels singing. And then verse 13. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that's in them. And they're saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. How many words? Four. What does four tell us? It's the whole of creation. Now all of creation is singing. Why? Because the Lamb who was slain has conquered. And he's worthy. And so this echo, this reverberating praise is making its way out. It's this explosion of worship that's happening. Then verse 14, all the way back to the middle. And the four living creatures said, amen, or so it is, as it is, so it be. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Go back up to verse eight. You wanna know how this whole thing started? The elders fell down and worshiped, which means now they're gonna sing again, and then the angels are gonna sing again, and then creation's gonna sing again, and then the elders are gonna fall down again. It's this idea of it's on and on and on and on. It continues to go. So this powerful moment is happening, but we can't, gosh, we can't miss the significance of the medium being the message. If we do, we're gonna miss the entire point of the Bible. John's told there's a scroll, there's a purpose and a plan to all of this. Everything he's experiencing has purpose and plan. And there's something coming. There's been a method to all of this. There's something coming. And again, we can relate to this. Have you ever felt like you wanted someone or something to make sense of your experience? Have you ever felt like you're in your own Asia Minor? You're on your own Isle of Patmos alone, lonely by yourself, and you just need someone to tell you why. Why? You want, you want answers. You want someone or something to tell you why it happened or why it is happening? Or maybe you, you want someone who's gonna open the scroll to tell you, hey, the people who did those terrible things to you, I'll take care of them coming for them. And so what if, what if you're told, yeah, there's a reason, but it's sealed up, that your hope seems lost. You'll never know. Wouldn't you weep? And then he hears, hey, listen, but it's okay. There's a lion. The lion's gonna rip open the scroll. The lion who conquered. And you're like, yes, finally. Finally, someone has the answers. Someone to make sense of this of all of the madness and chaos, maybe you're like, oh, finally someone to invoke revenge. Oh, I can't wait to watch this. And then you're told it's a lion. Like, yeah, tear him limb from limb. I can't wait to see what happens. You're told it's a lion. And so here's what happens. We're told that, and so we begin to go on a search, a hunt for the lion. Because you're told, oh, a lion will make sense of this? The king of the jungle is gonna make sense of this? So we begin, we begin searching for the aggressor. We're looking for the strong one, for the warrior. 
And when we can't find one to give us answers, we become the lion. We become the aggressor. We're like, oh, it takes a lion to make sense of what's happening to me? I'll be that lion. I'll make it happen. I'll be the aggressor. So you storm into a boardroom like, I demand answers. You storm into your lawyer's office. You go off on your husband or your wife. You go off on your kids or a teacher or a coach. You're like, I will figure this out. You argue with doctors and attorneys. You fight for your own wants and desires because if you don't, no one will. There's got to be a purpose and a plan to all this. I'm going to make sure, I'm going to make dang sure that I know why. And you become the lion. So don't miss this. John hears lion but sees a lamb. The lion isn't the answer. The lamb is slaughtered baby lamb. And he's not worthy because he has the strength of a lion. He's not worthy because he was aggressive and demanded things of other people. He was worthy because he surrendered his life. For some of us, we don't like that at all. We've been looking for the lion and we've missed the lamb. We want a Messiah like a lion. We want him to roar and to rule and reign with force and brazen aggression. And we can't wait till he or she gets what's coming to him. But it's affected how we study the scripture. It's affected how we read Revelation. It's affected how we see the church. And it's affected how we see people. It's affected how we see other countries and ethnicities. One of the saddest commentaries to me about the misinterpretation of the book of Revelation is how it's taught us to view other countries. Because we want a lion, we've made an enemy of Russia. Go back and see what the slain lamb brings, a tribe of every nation and tongue. You know what that means? Russians will be there. And it means African Americans will be there. And it means Asians will be there. And it means Germans will be there. You okay with that? We've been taught some stuff that's made us really get a jacked up view of all this. So anyone that rises to power, he's the Antichrist. Look at at Russia again. Oh man, we don't want a lion. We need the lamb. Our pursuit of the lion affects how we vote. It affects what we want in our bosses and leaders and spouses and kids and coaches and teachers because we're looking for a lion to give us all the answers. But the answers don't come from the lion, they come from the slaughtered lamb. Because that Messiah we created is not the one of the Bible. In fact, all the way back to Isaiah chapter 53, when Isaiah prophesies of the Messiah, here's how he describes the Messiah, that he will be oppressed, afflicted, but he opened not his mouth. Look at this phrase, like a lamb led to the slaughter. And like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. And we don't like that, do we? That's our Messiah, the one who won't fight, the one who won't push back, the one who refuses to die. I mean, you can't tell me that the Messiah, the one who conquered, is the one who willingly walks towards death. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. Exactly what I'm saying. Jesus, the Messiah, right, the lamb who's being arrested to put on a mock sham trial before he is crucified. It's in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, all the soldiers come to arrest him. One of his disciples, Peter, is like, I'm not going to let this happen. He tries to put an end to it, but he's terrible with a knife, and so he tries to kill a guy and misses and cuts his ear off instead. And look at Jesus' response to him in Matthew 26. Put your sword back into its place. For all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you get it? Like if I wanted to, I could appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels. If I did that, how would the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must be so. When we come looking for answers and we come looking for a lion, we miss Jesus. We miss the slaughtered lamb. Listen to me, there are answers There's a method to the madness. There's a plan and a purpose unfolding. There's a way this world is working and moving, but it can only be found through the slaughtered lamb. 
will not be found through your intelligence or through your work ethic. It will not be found from other political leaders. It will not be found in a president or in a Congress. It will not be found. It will not be found in a new job. It will not be found in a new spouse. It will not be found when you leave whatever this is to go pursue your own thing. It will not be found. You want answers to the struggles in life, to the pain you're feeling, the suffering you're in. It will only be found through the slaughtered lamb. We aren't taught that. We aren't discipled in that way. So we fight and we revolt and we put bumper stickers on our car and we get in fights on social media. How's that going for you? You feel more at peace? You feel like you found some answers in the way you talk to people? The way to the answers is the way of the lamb. But I know it sounds foolish. But it shouldn't surprise us that it sounds foolish. It's always sounded foolish. The Apostle Paul is writing a letter to the church at Corinth. He understands it. He's telling them, I understand, I understand, I understand, but this is the way. So here's 1 Corinthians 1, verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly, it's foolishness to those who are dying. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. So where is the one who's wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the expert? Where's the one who loves to debate? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs. There's some who will only be convinced if they see some miraculous sign. The Gentiles, the Greeks, they want wisdom. Some want signs, some want understanding. But we preach Christ crucified. We preach the slaughtered lamb. That's who we preach. A stumbling block to those who want signs and those who want understanding. But to us, to the ones who are called, some of us who wanted signs, some who wanted understanding, this crucified Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Do you see the horns in the eyes? Do you see it? Seven horns of power, the seven eyes of wisdom. You know the problem? The crucified Christ is full of divine wisdom and power, but we're too busy looking for the lion. And it's foolish. I know. I know it doesn't make sense to surrender. It doesn't make sense to give your life over. It doesn't make sense to do that. No, we gotta gotta fight. Yeah, we're gonna fight, but we're gonna fight like the lamb. That's how we fight. We lay our lives down. No, I gotta fight for what's mine in my marriage. No, you don't. You gotta lay your life down. No, I gotta fight for what's right in my job. No, you don't. You gotta lay your life down. You wanna make sense of it? Lay your life down. Follow the way of the lamb. And I know, like I know in the room there's people right now who are walking through. I don't, I don't understand. I need answers. I can't make sense of all of this. Listen to me. You will not find answers through aggression. You will only find answers through surrender. I know you don't like that. But that's the formation of our hearts. The way of Jesus. John's going to get his answers. You and I will get our answers through the seals and the trumpets and the bowls. We're going to see it. But we're only going to get there through a heart of surrender and submission. I'm, I just don't want you to miss the lamb. I don't want you to miss him because the world has built up something else. The way to it, the way to peace and understanding is to surrender. Do you bow your heads and close your eyes? And I don't know exactly what you're feeling right now. It's quiet. It just tells me you're feeling something. And I'm sure you can disagree with me, and that's, we can disagree all day long. I just don't mean to disagree with the Bible. The lamb is worthy because he defeated death. And he didn't defeat death by running around the ring and not being punched. He defeated death by taking its best blow and then standing right back up. In Genesis chapter 2, Adam and Eve fall into sin. 
And God meets them and says, hey, listen, the punishment of this is, is death. I told you that before. If you sin, you will surely die. Ah, we're not gonna die. So the ultimate punishment for your sin is death. But what if, what if I told you it didn't have to be? What if I told you that death had been defeated? It no longer has power or sting over you. What if I told you that? What if I told you the only weapon the enemy had was to threaten you with death no longer exists anymore? Would you follow that lamb? Because you don't defeat death by avoiding it. You defeat death by destroying it. So the lamb took it. So maybe today what you need to hear is all of your efforts trying to avoid uh, death, your own spiritual death by good behavior, doing the right things, being a church, checking off boxes, doing devotional, listening to podcasts, good for you. It's not gonna work. The only way to spiritual life is to surrender to the slaughtered lamb, who, by the way, is still standing. Maybe today you need to surrender your own heart and attitude that maybe you've been pursuing the way of the dragon or the way of the lion and not the way of the lamb. So it's in your heart, it's in your words, it's in your marriage, it's in your job, it's with your kids, it's social media, it's with the government, it's with teachers and coaches. But what if I told you you'll never find answers there? The only way to answer is, is surrender. Don't miss the lamb. God, we are hardwired as fallen creatures to want our own way, to pursue our own glory, to build our own kingdoms. And you're not, this, you're not surprised by it. You've seen it for generations. You saw it in the wilderness. You saw it in the Tower of Babel. You saw it in the book of Judges. You've seen it in my life pursuit of our own glory and kingdom will never get us the peace our hearts so greatly desire. So for those of us right now experiencing our own Asia Minor, experiencing our own Isle of Patmos, God, would you clue us in, give us eyes to see the lamb, bloodied, slaughtered, though standing. May we surrender to him, surrender our aggression that we might find peace in that surrender. Form us into your image through the way of the Lamb. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.